Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, guys, and welcome to See Results. You're live with us right here on IBN. And of course, for those of you who are locked on with us on our Facebook um, pages, that's See Results and on IBN TV, you are streaming live with us. Welcome to one and all. So, as you know, I am Miss Nyla, and I will be taking you through creative writing today, or at least the first half of the creative writing segment, where we will later welcome Sea Jazz. Uh, where he usually gives us a highlight of all the top performing students, as well as those of you who need a little improvement. We highlight th um, those pieces and we show you how you can make them better or improve them one way or another. So just stay tuned for that. That is coming up um, a little later this um, evening. So what we are going to do now, we are going straight into creative writing. And uh, last day for creative writing, we looked at the writing process. Now, we completed the writing process, actually. So if you missed that entire um, segment, or segments, I should say, rather, on the writing process, I urge you to go back and rewatch those video videos. So in the writing process, we know that it included five stages. And as you can see here, we have the pre-writing, drafting, revision, editing, and publishing stage, or stages in the writing process. Each one, we went through it um, very carefully. We took our time. We even looked and analyzed a short story or a narrative piece, and we looked at all the different stages, how to get from the pre-writing stage to the publishing stage to complete that writing process. We said that the writing process was really important to help you to improve your writing. You know, it's a step that you can take to, you know, if you're, you're a person, you're writing all the time and you find like your work is not where you want it to be, it's not up to standard. You follow the writing process and that will help you, you know, to better yourself or better your creative writing style. Okay, guys? So that's about it for the writing process. Now, from the writing process, we saw the comments made from when we analyzed the piece, how, um, you know, what should be done, how and what should be done to improve that writing. And from that, we came out with um, that student needed to work on descriptive language there was a lack of descriptive language as well as figurative language. So that's what we want to start on today. So we want to start lo looking and working on descriptive language. When we talk about descriptive language, what immediately comes to your mind? And it's right behind me here. We know that descriptive language or, you, or uh, the five senses or involves the five senses. And those five senses, we know them, right? All of us have them. It's a sense of touch, smell, taste, hearing, and sight. All of these senses that you are seeing here, or the five senses that you know, um, you, you are aware of, that we have, these are the senses we use in our writing to make our writing more interesting, to make our writing come alive. So if I want to, to talk about how something tastes, I will use the sense of, taste. If I want to talk about how something smells, I'll use a sense of smell, and so on and so forth. But what you need to know in all of this is that the language associated with descriptive language, if you know what I mean. You need to know a wide range of vocabulary. You need to be using your vocabulary or using your synonyms, your antonyms, and all of those that you have been learning, and all of those that we have done so far. Now it's time for you to put them to use. So for example, I have for you here um, quite a long list uh, involving the five senses here. And under each sense, I have put a few words for you there to help you to describe. So if you're doing a descriptive piece, which we don't do for SEA, but we do write description or use descriptive language in our narrative story. So this is where it comes in and where you need to know it. So for example, if I want to talk about sight, I want to talk, probably I'm talking about um, the setting of a story, and I'm, I want to talk about what I am seeing. I can use all of these words here, and of course, many, many more to describe what I am seeing. So you can say um, polished. So the polished floors, or even if you want to use polished to describe a character. So you can say um, he had teeth, his teeth was like polished pearls. So you know, they are white and shiny or crinkled, you talk about how somebody's clothes looks. It's crinkled or wrinkled, or blurry, how you probably saw something. You probably fell to the ground, hit your head when it got up. This is how you were seeing, blurry. Misty, you're describing the atmosphere outside. Opaque or fuzzy, gloomy, 
filthy or pale. All of these are describing words uh, you can use in your writing. So if some of these are new to you, I think that one or two maybe, add them to your vocabulary list, especially if you don't know the meaning of these words, and start revising them. I want you to start using new words in your vocabulary. Um, I don't know if you remember, but I think that you do. We spoke about uh, words to replace overused words or boring words. So instead of saying said all the time, we, we gave you an extensive list um, that you can follow to replace that word said, right? So if um, in all of your stories, you're accustomed saying um, gloomy, it was dark and gloomy outside, try something different. Yes, that may work for you, but if, if you know your teacher is giving you the comment that you're always using the sentence, try something different, here's a chance for you to try something different, okay? Get your dictionary, use it hand in hand with your writing, during the writing process, and that will help you to develop your vocabulary, okay? What about hearing? If I want to appeal to the sense of hearing, I can say crackle, gasping, and some of these words here, well, immediately when you say them, you, you know what they mean. You can picture it, what is happening, a character in that situation. Hissing. What comes to mind if you say hissing or even rattle? What comes to mind here? Whack, thump, slurp, screech, honk, clash. All of these here uh, appeals to the sense of hearing. And immediately, once you read these words, you know exactly what is taking place in that story. You can picture it. And that is precisely what you want to do. You want your reader to get a picture or an image in their head so they can clearly see what is happening. You want to paint that picture for them. Let's move on to the sense of smell. How do things smell? It might be moldy, burnt, fishy, limey, minty, earthy, pungent, rancid, vanilla, or putrid. Like I said before, this list is very long. I have just chosen a few for you. So you can practice using these or even add to this list. Taste, something maybe salty, citrus, buttery, garlicky, milky, smoky, spoilt, peppery, oily, or musty, right? And touch, sense of touch, gooey, soggy, thorny, icy, moist, greasy, creamy, damp feverish or coarse. All of these words here help you to paint a picture or the reader to vividly see what you are talking about. And that's what you want to do. You want your reader to be captivated by what you are writing. Hence the reason we are using all of your senses here and descriptive language. So what if I wanted to use um, all these senses here that we just discussed in a sentence? Would you be able to use your five senses uh, to, develop sen uh, to develop sentences? Can you do that? Or how do you do it? I just have a few examples here for you. And we are going to point out, you know, to which sense does it apply. So let's look at sentence number one here. The white puffy clouds blanketed us as we stroll along the lush green field. Now I want you, uh, while you are at home or wherever you are, Look at this sentence and determine which sense is this sentence appealing to. And if you are thinking sight, if you are thinking sight, you are correct. So you can say, which words here appeal to sight? White, you can see the puffy clouds. If it's a blanketed us, they're talking about vast covering, okay? It's widely spread as we stro strolled along the lush green field. Again, it appeals to the sense of sight. What about sentence number two? The old, the old wooden chair creaked as Tom slouched forward into a deafening snore. Here are your clue words. We have uh, deafening, snore. When you think of somebody snoring, or your dad or your mom, you, uh, you immediately know how that sounds, right? That snore there. And creaked, creaked is another one. Maybe um, when you go to visit probably a uh, relative and they may have a board floor and you walk on it, you can hear a creaking sound or maybe an abandoned house if you wanna use that choice of word there when you are describing 
an abandoned house. So here we have creaked and we have deafening snow, right? That snow was quite loud. So which sense do these words appeal to here? And it's very straightforward and you can easily tell us it's to the sense of hearing simply from the underlying words there. Now, if I wanted to talk about taste, this is another way here, or a sentence, an example sentence, in which I can speak about how something may taste. The sweet, peppery taste of pineapple chow entice my taste buds. Here, clue word for you here, taste buds, you know that's in your mouth. So if you didn't know, but when you came across these words here, you can immediately tell or distinguish which scents we are appealing to. So we have the words sweet and peppery taste, right? Both of these appeal to the sense of taste. I want you to take notice or take heed of how we can use them in, in constructing sentences, right? This is what you need to do in your writing. Don't just um, use all the old vocabulary that you know or you write a sentence one simple way. Don't follow that same style and strategy. Um, always you can try something new, okay? Especially if you want to up your game. Let's move on to number four. As I walked into the musty room, I sprayed my fruity perfume to dampen the moldy odor. So all of these words here, we have musty, and you can imagine, or maybe rings a, ring a bell. So you know when you hear that word musty, you know that smell. You know what comes to mind. That fruity perfume dampened the moldy odor. So this word odor here was your clue. So it refers to the sense of smell. And your last sentence, the jagged edge pierced my soft, tender palms. Your clue words here. Jagged, soft, tender palms. So they're speaking about your hands here. So the jagged edge pierced my soft, tender palms. Appeals to the sense of touch. So great. We just spoke about the five senses and we looked at some words we can use to help us with descriptive writing, which appeals to the five senses. And then we looked at some sample sentences, which you know, you can follow if you would like to create similar sentences or even use these sentences in your writing. So now that we have completed descriptive language, a very short, you don't have um, a lot of work there to actually memorize, but what you do need to do, you do need to know these words, okay? You need to be familiar with your synonyms, your antonyms, your homophones, all of the vocabulary that you have been learning so far. Just be mindful of it when you are writing. Be creative, that's why it's called creative writing. And try to think outside the box and use your language to express yourself, right? So now we are gonna move on to figurative language. Now figurative language is a lot like descriptive language in the sense that we use them to enhance our writing. So we know that figurative language or a figure of speech makes use of words Phrases or expressions to show some form of comparison, emphasis, or exaggeration. So this is, these are the reasons here why we use figurative language. So most importantly, to show a comparison, to show emphasis, or to show exaggeration. Now, we are just going to be going through a few today. So I want you to take note as we are going. I know that a lot of you... Um, you get problems when you are doing poetry with, you know, identifying your figurative language. Now, while figurative language is popularly found in poetry, it is also often used in writing. So there's an overlap there. Like I said, um, ELA and creative writing is very closely linked. So that's why you need to pay attention to both ELA and creative writing. Some of you may not like creative writing as much as ELA, but you know what? It's just a few more weeks, guys, and this is where you need to buckle down and put, you know, whatever you don't like aside and just work, okay? We want the best results possible, and this is the only way to achieve it. Focus and apply all that you are learning. So let's move on with figurative language. 
We know that words used mean more or something other than what it seems to say. So figurative language, uh, you know, sometimes you see something, you see a phrase there or a sentence and you don't know what it means or you know what it means or you want to say something but you don't want to directly say it, you use figurative language, right? So you're not, you're not saying it, you know, in plain words but you're kind of hiding its meaning. So you need to know and become familiar with all the different figurative language or figures of speech, I should say, rather. So in other words, the words used are not literally or exactly true, which is, just we, is what we just said. So here are the few figures of speech we are going to be discussing today. We have similes, metaphors, personification, onomatopoeia, and hyperbole. So you need, I know a lot of you when you are doing poetry, you get problems in identifying your metaphors and some of you even with personification. Um, simile is a little more straightforward, but I'm going to help you through it, don't worry. Here's an opportunity for you, you know, if, you have, if you're probably doing a poetry right now and you're stuck, because they're asking you to identify a metaphor in the, in the poem and you are not sure what you are looking for. So I'm going to help you to distinguish between similes, metaphors, and so on, and then you know you can easily use them in your writing to make it a little more interesting or spicy. So let's start with similes. Now, first of all, we need to know what is a simile, right? And like I said, this is one of the simple, sim simpler, I should say, sorry, ones. A simile is a figure of speech used to compare two unlike things by using like or as, or as or like. So it's a comparison using as or like. So for example, the young boy was as brave as a lion when he defended himself against the thieves. Now, can you identify the simile in this, in this sentence here? Very easy to point out, as brave as. Because one of our simile word, words there is as. So as brave as there is our simile. And what is he being compared to? He is brave as a lion, right? So we know lions are very brave. So that's the comparison in this sentence. What about in sentence number two? Chris popped out of his seat like toast out of a toaster. So I wonder if you have ever toasted bread using a toaster and when it's finished, you see that pop there? That's the comparison they are making. You know, it's, it's, it's all of a sudden, it just happens. That is what they are talking about or the comparison they are making here. So we know Chris is not similar to a toaster. So the two things are unlike, they are, they are not similar, right? So we have out of a seat, like toast out of a toaster. So that's how quickly or urgently or suddenly he sprang out of his seat. Now, a lot of times when you're doing similes or learning about similes, we learn the similes, but we don't learn the meanings of them. It's important that you know what each simile or the ones that you are using, at least, you know the meaning of them. You can randomly select a simile and put it in your writing to say that you have figurative language. Of course, it needs to be in context and it needs to make sense. So I have just a few for you here um, using as, and then we're going to move on to those with like. And I'm going to show you how you can use it. Or maybe even you can think of a sentence or two, how you can use that simile there, and you need to know the meaning as well. So first we have as free as a bird. So you can probably say he felt as free as a bird, but what does that mean? That means that person has no worries or no troubles. You know, a bird can go wherever they want, they can come when they want, they can leave when they want, right? It's an expression that we are all familiar with, and that is what it simply means there. What about as clean as a whistle? Very clean, okay? That simply means that whatever you are describing there is very clean. As clear as mud. That means it's not actually clear at all. Can you see through mud? No, you cannot, right? Especially thick, dark, gray mud. You cannot see through it. So it's, um, you, it means that it's not clear at all. You cannot see through that. What about as dead as the dodo? And for those of you who don't know what a dodo is, a dodo is a type of bird, right, that's now extinct. So as dead as a dodo, 
literally means dead or extinct, right? So in your spare time, you can probably do a little research about the dodo bird if you would like to find out some information about that. As bright as a new pin. So a pin is usually very bright and shiny. As easy as ABC, which means very easy, right? Um, so if somebody else is having difficulty with something and you want to say, well, I can't do that. It's easy as ABC or easy as one, two, three, right? You know, you know that's right off the bat. You know it. You don't even have to think twice about it. And that's what it means. It just means very easy. As cunning as a fox simply means sly. We know that a fox has a reputation of being sly or cunning. And that's what it means there. It just means sly. Now, let's look at similes here using like. Those two girls are like two peas in a pod, meaning they are very close, right? So probably close friends. I just want to point out that um, sometimes you can substitute like for as or as for like, depending on what your expression is. Moving on, the man sleeps like like a log. So it should have an A, it should have A here. The man sleeps like a log, right? So it simply means he sleeps soundly. You know, sometimes somebody's asleep and you cannot wake them up, not even a creak or a crack uh, may wake them. He is asleep, he's asleep soundly. She hung her head like a drooping flower. So when you think of a drooping flower, how do you picture that flower, right? What state is that flower in? So that person may be sad or disappointed. Generally, uh, when somebody is sad or disappointed, they may just hang their head, you know, with disappointment or something like that. Kate swims like a fish. That means that Kate swims well naturally, that she has a natural ability, right? Some people are just talented swimmers and Kate might be one of them. Her smile is bright like the sun. Her smile is radiant and lights up the room. So guys, now that you are familiar with similes with using as and those using like, I want you to get any practice of using them a little more in your writing if you are not already in that practice or in that habit. If you don't want to jump directly into the writing itself, do some sentences and analyze the meanings of those sentences. Have somebody look them over, make sure you're on the right track, and then you can probably put them to use in your creative writing. Now, let's move on to metaphors. Our second uh, figure of speech. A metaphor is a comparison of two unlike things without using the words as or like. So we just saw that similes is also a comparison using uh, like or as. They also compare two things that are unlike. A metaphor, however, is also a comparison, but we are not going to use as or like. So it's um, similar in the sense that they both make a comparison, but you, know, you must know that they differ in the use of words, and that is like and as, or as. So for example, the classroom was a zoo. What do you think that means, right? So sometimes your teacher might say that this classroom is like a zoo, right? Or not like, or the classroom is a zoo. Today, so what she really means by that is not that it literally has monkeys and tigers and snakes and so on. No, that students are behaving wildly, right? So number two, your brain is a computer. So you can think really quickly, just as if you want to find out something on Google and you search whatever it is, you're going to get that answer really quickly. Same thing, if you ask a really brilliant student a question, they will be able to answer you within seconds, right? A really quick thinker. So here we have some more metaphors and we also have its meanings. So we have here, Jamal was a pig at dinner. Do you think Jamal is really a pig? Can Jamal really be a pig? In this case, Jamal is a person, but we are saying Jamal was a pig at dinner, which means that he was very messy. Probably the manner that he ate or his, how he kept his table or his clothes after eating and so on. I wish you weren't always such a chicken. And this is a popular one here. We always call our friends chickens. But what are we saying? We are saying that they are afraid to do something or try something new. Try to refrain from that, okay? Especially name calling. Life is one long scary roller coaster. 
Is life a really a roller coaster? Can you literally jump in a roller coaster? Yes, you can. But when we talk about life being a roller coaster, we are actually saying that life has its high points and its low points. So sometimes you may be happy, good things happen to you, and sometimes you may be sad or whatever it is, and not so many good things are happening to you right now. Moving on, you are my guardian angel, a helpful or protective person. So we like to say this a lot, you are my guardian angel. So this refers to somebody who is really helpful and protective over you. The golden, the golden ball shone in all its glory. So glory is just missing here, so I'm just going to add that in here. In all its glory, it just simply means the sun shone brightly, okay? The sun was nice and bright that day. Okay, just checking something here. All right. All right, so we just have, we now we're moving on to personification. And right before we move on to personification and we talk about its meaning, we're just going to take a short break and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere, guys. Make sure you have your notepad in front of you and you're ready to take notes, okay? We'll be back after these short messages. Assalamu alaikum, good evening guys and welcome back uh, with C results. So right before the break, we were discussing figurative language. We already spoke about descriptive language at the start of this uh, segment and we learned all about the five senses and how you can use them in sentences most importantly, right? And now we are looking at figurative language. So far we discussed similes, we discussed metaphors and now we are moving on to personification. Now, first of all, we need to know what is personification, right? And we should know that personification is a figurative language technique where an object or idea is given human characteristics or qualities. So here you are given an inanimate object, human-like qualities. So for example, the sun smiled at me warmly. Can the sun actually smile? No, we know that the sun cannot actually smile, but maybe how that, that felt, you know, the warmth of the sun shine that day, how it felt over that person's body made them feel um, like the sun was smiling at them warmly, okay? So it was a warm sensation how they felt from that sun, from the sunlight. 
the bees kissed every flower in the lovely garden. So when we think about bees kissed every flower here, it's not what, like what we are thinking about with a human kiss. Not like that how mommy would give you a kiss or something like that. That's not what we mean. The bees kissed every flower here, meaning that the bees went from flower to flower um, feeding on their nectar, right? So it probably sampled all the flowers in the garden on that day. So we know that bees cannot actually kiss and we know that the sun cannot actually smile. So we're given inanimate objects, human-like qualities. So, so here we have uh, some more examples of personification as well as we have their meanings. So the angry rain pounded on my windows. So is rain angry? Can rain feel angry? No, it cannot, right? The rain... The rain was falling hard against the windows. That's what it means there. When we say the angry rain pounded on my windows, we are just simply saying that the rain was falling hard against the windows. But think about it. If you are, in, you are writing your essay, which of these will you use? Will you use a literal meaning? Or do you think it's more interesting to use personification here? And I would think that you are going with the option of using it as personification. It makes your writing more interesting. It gives your, right, um, your reader something to think about. Let's go on to the next example. Dave's pencil was flying across his page. Do you think that a pencil can actually fly? No, it cannot, right? So, he was writing really quickly. So, how quickly he was writing, it seemed as though that, you know, his pencil was flying across the page. The red light yelled, stop. We know what, what the red light, what a red light is or a traffic light is. Do they actually say stop when you are at the traffic light? No, they don't. It just simply means that red traffic light is a signal to stop your car, right? Again, given an inanimate object, human-like qualities because they cannot actually speak. Red light cannot speak or a traffic light cannot speak, but humans can and we can say stop. The old door moaned in protest as it opened. Again, the old door moaned in protest. So it's saying here that, you know, the door is trying to say something, but we know that doors don't speak. So what am I saying if I use this sentence? What is the reader saying here? And they're actually saying the old door creaked because it had not been opened for a long time. So you can probably change that meaning um, by one or two words, but generally this is what um, we want to say when we use this personification here. The apples jumped off the tree. Can apples actually jump? No, but can humans jump? Of course we can, right? The apples were falling to the ground. Just another way to say the apples jumped off the tree, which is of course a little more interesting. Okay, so I just have one more figure of speech to complete here, right? And then Sajaz is going to join me and we are going to move on, of course, to showcasing some of your talent today. So let's move on to onomatopoeia. So we know that onomatopoeia is a word or group of words that when spoken aloud imitates the sound it produces, right? So we know... We know, we know that if you use the word boom, that song there, when you read it aloud, you must immediately know what it means. So if I say boom, once I sound out that word there, it imitates the sound it produces. So boom, and you know what comes to mind. Or pop, slurp. And the reason I have uh, three R's here, you can even have five R's there, is however you want to exaggerate that point or that sound, okay? Bam, splash. If you wanted to add three H's here to the word splash, you can as well, okay? Boing, maybe you're jumping on a spring, and that's the sound you will get there. Or ah, or z. And this z sound here um, is actually, you know, probably when somebody is snoring or something like that, right? So just be mindful that onomatopoeia is a word or a group of words when spoken aloud, imitates the sound that it produces. 
And I have some examples here, and we're just going to go through these examples, and we are going to point out the onomatopoeia in each one of these sentences. Remember, uh, when you read that word or those words, you must be able to tell immediately the sound that they, they produce. So I have here, on my first morning on the farm, I was awoken suddenly by cockle doodle doo of the resident rooster. Now, what is your onomatopoeia in this sentence here? If you say cockle doodle doo, you are correct, right? It might be a little funny, you might giggle a bit, but you must know that it gives you, you know, produces a sound when you pronounce it. What about sentence number two? Quack, quack, when the ducks, as we threw them, our stale bread. Onomatopoeia here, quack, quack, sound. Number three, zip. My dress was fastened and I was finally ready for the wedding. Can you hear that um, sound of a zip when you say the word zip? Say the word zip with me and you will understand what I mean. If you say the word zip, you can picture um, that sound or that sound is familiar to you. It's more like you're hearing it while you are saying it. So you have that zip there. It was lovely to wake up to the tweet of the birds outside my bedroom window. And this is precisely, precisely the sound that birds make or what we used to refer to the sound of birds, tweet. Right, guys? And number five, the loud boom of the fireworks scared the dog. You want to massapear here? Boom. That sound there. So just to reinforce what we did today, uh, we spoke about descriptive language using the five senses, and we went on to speak and use figurative language. So we discussed similes, we discussed metaphors, personification, and we just did onomatopoeia. This is important, especially when we are going to move on to poetry in ELA. So, you know, don't think that you don't need to know this right away. You actually do. School is going to be reopened really quickly. You know, it's crunch time, so you're going to be doing a lot and a lot of work. Extra work, I should say, right? Writing essays, getting ready for SEA. So, all that you have learned so far, guys, I urge you to... You know, practice it. Really impress yourself, impress your teachers, impress your parents. So that's it for me today. But what, uh, well, not today, I should say, but for now, I'm going to invite Sir Ejaz on. He's going to come on and showcase um, a couple pieces of students' work today. And then later at 6, I'll be rejoining you for our ELA segment. So we're just going to give Sir Ejaz a minute to join us or accompany us to here today. Good evening, assalamu alaikum, and welcome back to See Results on IBN TV. Um, we are also streaming on our Facebook pages, the See Results Facebook page, as well as the IBN TV Facebook page. All right, so um, we asked you all on our last batch of assignments, which was due on the 19th of December, right? We also had some that were due on this Monday, but prior to that, we ask you all to come up with some paragraphs for us demonstrating your knowledge of the transitional words that Miss Nyla has been teaching you, all right? She's done several so far. She has already surpassed this, but at that point in time, we had covered transition words dealing with additions, with comparing and contrasting ideas, with time, as well as in giving examples, all right? So you all sent us your submissions on the Edmodo app. And parents, of course, if this is the first time that you're viewing us on Facebook or on TV, do visit um, edmodo.com and sign up for our 
free web class where we post assignments and quizzes every week based on the content that we have covered for that particular week. All right, and we do every week as well, shine the spotlight on our high achieving students so that everyone hopefully will have a chance to have their name up there before SEA comes around, okay? And also, if you have missed all of our episodes so far, there are two ways in which you can view the prior episodes to help you study, to use it as a reference for your preparation for SEA. All right, you can look at the videos under the videos tab in our Facebook page, or if you're not on Facebook, you're watching me on TV, everybody has access once you have the internet to YouTube, all right? You don't need to have an account with YouTube to look at YouTube videos. You just go to youtube.com and you search for C results and you will find all of our prior episodes have already been posted there. So we ask you, especially those of you who have YouTube accounts yourself or Google accounts, to subscribe to our channel as well, all right? So moving on to the transitional words and the, the paragraphs that our students had submitted to us. Okay, so the instructions, sorry, were for you to submit a paragraph on any topic that interests you using at least two different types of transition words or phrases covered in this week's creative writing episodes, all right? So at that point in time, we had covered addition, compare, contrast, time, and examples. So our first paragraph was submitted by Antonia Graham, all right? So we want to keep the focus there while we read. So she wrote to us, an interest to me is riding, particularly riding an all-terrain vehicle, ATV. All right, the sound of its loud engine and its power is thrilling. All right, so, so far so good. But we just want to mention, because this obviously overlaps with our ELA, that the word it's, all right, when showing possession, it does not have that apostrophe. So it's just I-T-S, all right? And we said that for this creative writing segment, we are not going to be um, too stringent about these things. We want to get you all writing, okay? We want to get you all using your imagination and trying to implement the rules. Of course, you will falter. Of course, you will make some mistakes. That's fine, all right? But this, this as we continue to read, you'll see that it was really well done, especially with respect to our transitions, all right? So the sound of its loud engine and its power is thrilling. Furthermore, we have a transition here of addition, all right? That's this. Furthermore, all right, that I'm highlighting here, the feeling of riding an ATV is terrific, all right? Nevertheless, so we're comparing here or contrasting. Nevertheless, it's like riding a mini truck, okay? So here we have another transition word being used. And despite its size, again, this despite telling us it's comparing or it's contrasting, the ATV with vehicles that are perhaps bigger than it, right? Despite its size, it is extremely powerful, okay? So this vehicle can also drive through rough terrain and slippery surfaces due to its gripping tires. And at last, or I think what she perhaps could have said there was lastly, all right, the all-terrain vehicle, or in summary, or to conclude something like that, the all-terrain vehicle lives up to its name. All right, so that was actually really well done. Some minor uh, mistakes there, grammatical mistakes with the use of its in particular we highlighted, and perhaps a better choice of word here or there, but all, all in all, a really great effort. So thank you, Antonia Graham, for your contribution and um, for letting the whole of our viewership know what a good writer you are, okay? So that was our submission number one, and we've picked out a few for you. Um, here's another, all right? And this is something that might be very topical amongst the youth. It's quite wordy, so let's go. Anime is an animated media which originated in Japan, all right? It can be identified by its unique art style as well as being characterized by as brightly colored, all right, as brightly colored. So we have this as well as here adding detail, all right. This form of entertainment is known for having fantastical themes along with an interesting plot and characters. And here now we have a transition of time. 
over the years. All right, anime has grown popular across the world. The most popular are, and um, Tiana is giving us some examples here now. Now, perhaps she could have used, for the purposes just of the exercise, uh, actual transition word of examples, but it's fine. Of course, this colon here does the job. All right, the most popular are Naruto and Ruruni Kenshin, which grasps the attention of the viewers while newer releases, such as The Rising of the Shield Hero and My Hero Academia has engaged people in the edge of the seat action. And this might be a culprit here or might be guilty of being a run-on sentence. Miss um, Nyla has discussed run-on sentences in the past, so this sentence perhaps could have been broken up. Um, so we do urge you all to look at our previous episodes on YouTube in particular. We have you know, the nice titles there so you'll know what exactly you're getting when you click on one of those videos, all right? So we also had here a, b a bit of a compare and a contrast, right? Sorry, um, comparing the old with the new. So the old being the Iruruni Kenshin and the Naruto and the newer releases such as the Rising of the Shield and the My Hero Academia, right? So this media has influenced the lives of many individuals, including myself, and this submission was given to us by Tiana Andrews. All right, so we have a number of transitions taking place here. Um, the paragraph is a little bit lengthy, but all in all, it does give us a good idea, or a good grasp of the theme, which is anime. And you all have to also bear in mind that what Ms. Nyla taught previously about paragraph writing, especially when we are writing a standalone paragraph. We have topic sentences, supporting details, and a concluding sentence. I wonder if the viewers at home can identify that within the paragraph, all right? So you always have to be thinking and reminding yourself of all of these concepts because they all work together to help you to improve your writing, to write pieces, to write essays that are interesting and that will grab you those marks that will take the attention or grab the attention of the examiner and help you to score as highly as you can in your creative writing. So thank you for that, Tiana, for teaching all of us a little bit about anime, all right? Perhaps some of us didn't have no idea about it. So we did open it up to any topic that was of interest to our students, all right? Reason being, we want their creative juices to be flowing, all right? We want them to show us, to, to express themselves and to use the tools that we are giving you, right? That Ms. Nyla is giving you on every creative writing session. So we have another submission, yet another submission by Shania Martin. And I have to say that the girls are really um, stepping up to the plate here. A lot of our creative writing submissions came from girls. We did have some from boys, all right? Um, but we try to pick um, the best of the lot for today. There will be times when we'll choose the ones that aren't so great. You know, not every episode we will. And in those cases, we won't um, necessarily, or we won't actually use the names, all right? So Shania is telling us something about her hobbies here now. So she said that music is my favorite hobby. I also sing and dance to it when I'm bored. So in addition to it being her favorite hobby, she's adding detail here by the use of this also. So that's an a transition word of addition, all right? I'm mostly interested in, and again, without, the, without necessarily using an example transition word there, an ex explicit one, she does have the use of this colon, all right? So she likes what she's mostly interested in, rock, hip hop, gospel, and K-pop, all right? And now we have a compare and a contrast. So although I prefer listening to music while using headphones, I likewise listen to it through speakers. All right, so we are admiring the artistry here. We, you know, this is actually a little more challenging than it looks, you know, because we are forcing you to, you, to use, sorry, uh, particular writing tools that you're being taught, all right? You may not necessarily write like this all the time, but it is a challenge that we are giving you to give us in one paragraph as many of these transitions as possible while keeping it cogent and keeping it, you know, understandable. All right, so instead of playing Roblox and Pixel Wheel like my brother, right, so another comparison being made here, 
Instead of playing Roblox and Pixel World like my brother, I pass time downloading new sounds, all right? And this past here should also be in the present tense. If you look at the sentence, instead of playing Roblox, playing, right? And Pixel World like my brother, so that should be I pass time downloading new songs, right? I have found that listening to music is far more relaxing in comparison to gaming, another transition here of compare and contrast. So despite of this, and it should actually be really in spite of this, all right, or despite this, despite of this isn't really uh, the, the real way to use it there, but you know, we get, we get the gist of it. And all, to, all in all, it's, it's a really good passage so far. So despite of this, everyone has their favorite activity and we should Respect that, all right? So a nice concluding sentence there. A very clear topic sentence as well in this paragraph. Lots of supporting detail and great usage of those transitions, all right? So I just want to take a moment now because we are fast approaching the time of the Maghreb Salah. Um, to mention to you guys, you know, we did have a couple more pieces there, but as the weeks go by, we are going to give you more and more of your submissions, all right? So if, so the time permitting, we'll do as many as possible, and you just continue to write and continue to do the best that you can. And you know, God willing, of course, once you give us uh, quality material to deal with, or maybe if you give us something very, you know, problematic, we might have to highlight it as well without the use of your name, of course. All right, so we, in relating to our creative writing sessions here now, I did promise, you know, before we went on the break there for last week that I'd do a graphic for it. So the IBN TV and the San Juan Muslim Ladies Organization is having an essay writing competition for 2020. And of course, you can use all of the tips and tricks and tools that we are giving you here on C results to come up with this essay, right? Why I love to fast in Ramadan, it's open to boys and girls 12 and under and it is due on Friday, the 10th of April at um, 2020, which is next year, right? So that is actually a week and one day after you would have written your SCE, all right? So you have a whole week if you're interested. And if you feel like you don't have the time to write it before SCE, you still have a week to put pen to paper, come up with this essay, all right? On why I love to fast in Ramadan. It must be handwritten, however, and it needs to be addressed to the IBN Ramadan essay competition, care of IBN TV 861 Bamboo Main Road, Bamboo Settlement Number 2, Val Sain. All right, so that's here at our studio. And the San Juan Muslim Ladies Organization have organized some nice cash prizes. Yes, these prizes are actually in cash. A first place prize of $5,000, second place of $3,000, and a third place prize of $2,000 thousand dollars all right so this is a, a lovely initiative by the ibn tv and the san juan muslim ladies organization and it also ties in quite nicely with what we are doing here on c results all right so we are helping you to earn that money hopefully all right and that prize so in conclusion for today for our new viewers our, you know every day we are getting new people signing up to our edmodo so that's why we are constantly reminding somebody is tuning in today for the first time, they're seeing it on Facebook and clicking, oh, I wonder what that is. And then they get excited and they message us, all right? So here are the details, okay? You visit edmodo.com and you register your child as a student using this code 6KJQ3Y. All right, this information is also available on our Facebook page in the cover photos area. All right, you visit at moto.com, you register as a student using these, this code provided, and your child will be able to access our quizzes and assignments. All right, we don't have any currently due because we were off air last week. The last batch was due on Monday, on this Monday go on, but by the end of this week, we will have new quizzes. And all of the quizzes viewers that have the words reopened in the title, you can continue to do them once you haven't done them already. So if you register today, there are lots of quizzes that were reopened, so you can feel free to do so, all right? So I will be leaving you now, and shortly we'll have the Maghreb Adhan, and then at 6 p.m. we'll be returning with Miss Nyla, who will be taking you through 
the English language. That's where you get to have a lot of fun calling in, all right? That's the part of the program that you enjoy the most, and we enjoy it a lot as well. So we'll see you all at 6 p.m. for the English language arts. I have been
Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, guys, and welcome back to See Results. I'm Miss Nyla, and now we are in for or getting started with um, our ELA segment. Now, we know yesterday, and yes, we are jumping straight into it, okay, because this hour quickly passes us by, and sometimes we don't have enough time to finish what we have started. So, in yesterday, um, the passage that we did here, we were on the last answer. So, we just had to answer this last or give the last grammatical error here. So let's read it so you can remember what we did. Thankfully, a security guard which came to our assistance found him. And we said the error here, we underline which, and it should actually be the relative pronoun, who. And we spoke a lot about relative pronouns already, and we know that the relative and pronouns include who, whom, whose, which, or that. So it's a matter of choosing the correct relative pronoun in this case. So I have a couple sentences here, so we're going to open up the lines. And uh, you can call us and use the appropriate relative pronoun for each sentence. So we're going to have, of course, like you know, for ELA, as we usually do, a lot of calls and lots of reinforcement exercises after we do each um, or figure out each grammatical error. Today, however, we are changing things up a little bit. Uh, in the sense that, yes, you're still going to call and give us your answers, but what we are doing today, we still have some punctuation to go through because what I found last day when we were actually doing punctuation, not yesterday, but the day before, when we, uh, before we closed off for that week, uh, we did a lot of punctuation, so recapping of punctuation, spelling, and so on. And I realized that we did not cover semicolon and hyphen. So before we move forward with um, our grammar, I want to discuss the use of the semicolon and hyphen because it's very possible that, you know, those can come in SE. And just to be careful, we need to cover them or we need to be mindful of them and how to use them in our writing. So let's go to the sentences here. So we have, remember, we are keeping in mind we are using relative pronouns to complete these sentences. So we have the flood victim, something lives close to the river, was offered further assistance. Which relative pronoun will you use here? And you can say the flood victim who lives close to the river was offered further assistance. Moving on to number two, mommy bought the watch, something was on sale. And for this number two sentence, you can either have which or that. Either one of these relative pronouns here can work um, in this sentence. Just be mindful, um, and like we said, that which and that can sometimes be used interchangeably. But there are also some cases where you actually have to use specifically that and which. And in case you missed that segment on relative pronouns, I urge you guys go back on YouTube because why I'm saying YouTube is very easy to, for you to find on YouTube as our videos have proper titles so you know which um, episode it deals with what. So the episode on relative pronouns, we spoke about the use of which and that. I went to use each one. Sentence three here. The house, something I like, was destroyed by fire. Again, you can use the relative pronoun, which or that. Both of these are again correct in this case. Number four. The lady, something, we invited is our aunt. Your which relative pronoun will we use here? And you can say whom. Important for you to note, um, which we already learned as well, difference between whom and who, and when to use who, and when to use whom. And sentence five, that is the girl, something, pet was missing. That is the girl whose pet was missing. Right, so we discussed and we used all the relative pronouns suitable for each sentence. Like I was saying, for today, we are going to do some punctuation, a continue with punctuation where we left off, and then we are going to go back to our grammar. So we're going to start with the semicolon. And I'm wondering how many of you um, know how to use the semicolon properly, or how many of you do not know how to use it, but rather use a colon or a comma in place of a semicolon. There's a difference uh, in this usage, and you must be able to tell when to use which one. 
because for punctuation, as you know, uh, what, while it's a one mark uh, per line, what you need to know, however, is that you actually have to insert the punctuation next to the word, as just as we have practiced in all the, in all the passages so far, right, uh, where you actually have to put in the, com the pu missing punctuation or capital letter. And there are no second chance there if you put the incorrect answer. So you have to be certain of what you are doing. So let's see. The semicolon can be used in place of a conjunction when two sentences are to be linked for comparison. Again, the semicolon can be used in place of a conjunction when two sentences are to be linked or for comparison. So be mindful, used in place of a conjunction or when two sentences are to be linked or for comparison. The two sentences must be closely connected, however, meaning that it must have the same idea or conveys the same idea in that sentence. So now we must know the when to use the semicolon or how to use that semicolon. And this here is your mark for a semicolon. It's simply a full stop or a period on top. Full stop or period on top and a comma below. It's usually in line, right? So we know that to separate two independent clauses. So I would use a semicolon to separate two independent clauses. And when I say independent clauses, we know that independent clauses can stand on its own. One or both of the clauses are short and the ideas expressed are usually very similar. Example. Oh, we have a couple, two examples here actually. He loves rock climbing. He can't wait to do it. So notice the ideas here, very similar, right? It's one idea. And he loves rock climbing. He can't wait to do it. Your semicolon comes between this first idea and the second idea. Number two, or the example number two, the pizzeria is located at the corner of Pepper Drive, south of the movie complex. So again, two ideas, but are similarly linked. And I want to point out to you here a common mistake. So I love cheeseburgers, and some of us may put a comma here. However, here you have your adverb, your conjunctive adverb, actually. I'm going to discuss this shortly so you don't be confused or you are not confused by the word what, however here. I love cheeseburgers, however, I hate how difficult they are to eat. So notice here, two similar ideas. So what punctuation or which punctuation should be used? Instead, we should say rather, I love cheeseburgers, semicolon, however, I hate how difficult they are to eat. And he explains briefly why we need a semicolon there in front of that conjunctive adverb. The conjunctive adverb, however, as seen here, signals a connection between two independent clauses. Your two independent clauses are, I love cheeseburgers, however, I hate how difficult they are to eat. Your two independent clauses. And commas should not be used to connect independent clauses if there is no coordinating conjunction. I'm just going to read this again. Uh, the conjunctive adverb, however, signals... So, however, here, signals a connection between two independent clauses. We pointed out our two independent clauses. I love cheeseburgers. However, I hate how difficult they are. And commas, as in the case of the error here, should not be used to connect independent clauses. So, what they are saying here, we have two independent clauses. So, you should not use a comma to join those independent clauses. Rather, use a semicolon. We do not use a comma when there are two independent clauses, only if there, especially if I should say rather, there is no conjunct, no coordinating conjunction. And we already learned what our coordination conjunctions are. And we learned that an abbreviation for them is fanboys. So for, and, no, but, and so on, right? So you need to be mindful of this here, this specific explanation especially in this case here where you can easily be tricked into thinking I need a comma but really you need a semicolon. First you look to see that there are two similar ideas and then you look to see if each of these sentences 
No sentence is rather, but clauses are independent. And if they are independent, you know that you cannot use a comma to separate these or link the sentence. sentence. So I have some sentences here. I'm going to open up the lines. You all can give a um, chorus and read that sentence to me, and I want you to identify where I need to put that semicolon. Just be mindful of uh, the use of the semicolon and how it's used, and if you see a conjunctive adverb here, just as we saw in however here, you wear your, where your semicolon needs to go, and to not put a comma instead. So I have the first sentence here. I have a big test tomorrow. I can't go out tonight. So because he has this big test, he wants to stay home to study, right? So it's two similar ideas. He has this big test tomorrow, so he needs to stay home to study tonight. So where will this uh, semicolon go? And if you are thinking, I have a big test tomorrow, semicolon, I can't go out tonight, you are correct. Notice there you have two independent clauses. I have a big test tomorrow and your second one being I can't go out tonight. Two independent clauses, they can both stand on it, their own. Number two, Harun has gone to the library. Andrew has gone to play football. First, let's see if they are linked. Harun has gone to the library. So that's the, where he went or the whereabouts of this first person. The second person has gone to play football. So the ideas are closely linked or they are similar, as well as both of these clauses can stand on their own. Harun has gone to the library. That could be one sentence if I want to write it separately. Andrew has gone to play football. So my semicolon needs to go after the word library. Harun has gone to the library, semicolon. Andrew has gone to play football. Number three. The cow is brown, it is also old. Let's see if the ideas are linked. The cow is brown, yes, it is also old. Here we can see they're speaking about the same cow, same similar idea. And they are both independent clauses. The cow is brown, it is also old. Both can stand on its own. So my semicolon here goes after the word brown. The cow is brown, it is also old. Number four, I like dogs, however, I hate the way they smell. So this sentence is actually similar to the one that we did previously. So I like dogs, that's your first independent clause. Your second independent clause, however, I hate the way they smell. So my semicolon goes after the word dog or dogs. Number five, some people write with a word processor Others write with a pen or pencil. So let's see if we can find our two independent clauses here. Some people write with a word processor. That's fine. Others write with a pen or pencil. So now I need to know that some people write with a word processor, semicolon, others write with a pen or pencil. Simple enough, well, however, what you need to do in order to perfect this is practice, okay? Because we forget this, we can, or we can't forget this really quickly and easily. So you need to practice it in your writing or even find an um, uh, exercise or a worksheet and do some practice, especially if that is not your strong point. And then now we want to move on to the hyphen. Now, we have use of a hyphen. The hyphen is used with a compound word, a number and fraction. So first of all, what is a compound word? A compound word, as we know, is a two words that are joined together to form a new word, or two root words joined together to form a new word. So the hyphen is used with a compound word, number, and fraction. For example, a number, I have 35. So if you are in your punctuation section and you just say 30, and you see five, just like this. And you're searching and you're searching and you're not sure what is your error there or where you need to put in that missing punctuation. Just know guys, that's your missing punctuation there, that hyphen, right? Simple as that. So between numbers such as 35 
or even 7 to 1, there is a hyphen in the middle. Or if I say fraction, 5 ninths or 3 fifths and so on. What about compound words? I have mother-in-law, brother-in-law, world famous, old fashioned, email, passerby, non-smoking, middle age, cooperation, non-existent. And these are just a few examples of uh, words that we use with the hyphen or words that need a hyphen or hyphenated words as we call them. So here's a chance for again, for guys, for you to call us and participate in this activity. Here, what we are going to do, we are going to read these sentences and we are going to put in the missing hyphen. So you need to read them carefully and, you know, look really critically and see where that you, where you really think or where is missing the, that hyphen. So let's see. Amy got a part-time job working at the pet store. Any missing hyphens there or where should I say that hyphen must go? The well-known actress received the award. Of all the ice cream flavors, chocolate and vanilla are the most popular. All the students were well-dressed for their class photo. He was tall and quite good-looking. So let's go to number one. We have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Kairi K. Hi, Kairi K. So number one, what do you think or where do you think I should put that hyphen? Between part and time. Excellent job. Would you like to you? try another as you are here with us? Yeah. Okay, let's do number two. Um, between well and known. Excellent job. Thank you so much for calling and giving us your answer there. Or answers, I should say, rather. Right, we have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, what's your name? My name is Soren. Nice to have you with us. So you have the chance here to answer for us number three or give us or tell us where that missing hyphen goes. The missing hyphen goes between ice and cream. Excellent job. Would you like to do number four as well? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes, you put a hyphen between well and dress. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your call and those correct answers. And then, guys, we are on that final sentence there. He was tall and quite good looking. And my hyphen or missing hyphen goes between good and looking. So that's simple enough as well. You know, these are all words that we are accustomed to seeing, but what you need to be accustomed to is using the hyphen, especially when you are writing and knowing which words needs a hyphen. And that's simple for you to remember and is because or because the hyphen is used with compound words, with numbers or in numbers and fractions. So that's quite simple there for you to remember. So now that we have completed all of the punctuation necessary for us to get through that essay exam or that task two in the ELA paper, we are going to do an exercise here where you have to call and punctuate each line or each sentence. Not each line I would say because this is a little different from the example pieces as we do in that there's an error in each line. So um, when you call, you're going to give me all the errors in that sentence. So we are talking about commas, full stops, exclamation marks, quotation, question marks, um, hyphen, and what we just did there, hyphen, and the semicolon. So you need to know all of those or remember all of those. And if this is the first time that you are viewing and you know that you are having little problems with punctuations, I urge you to go on our YouTube channel and, you know, look for that video. It's very easy for you to find the titles are there, the search titles are there, so you know what each, you know what each episode contains. As well as, um, if you don't have access to YouTube for some reason, go on Facebook, go and you can rewatch our videos once this video has ended. And of course, we had videos that has already been recorded. And, of course, right here on C-Results, IBN TV, replays every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 5 to 7 p.m. So you have a lot and lots of opportunities, I know, where you can view this or re-watch it, I might say, right? So you have no excuses here. So we have just a short paragraph here, and 
we are going to punctu uh, punctuate this paragraph. So we are putting missing punctuation and possibly capital letters. So let's see. So we're going to read it first as we usually do and then we are going to find the missing punctuation and so on. From time to time, every one of us suffers from the common flu. The bravest, strongest and those with the greatest willpower fight off this unwanted attacker. Some of the symptoms of the common cold are sneezing, coughing, the runny nose, and at times severe headaches. It is believed that the common flu is caused by a bacteria. We'll say there is no cure. So now that we have read the entire passage, as I always encourage you to do, familiarize yourself with the content and then, then start reading it line by line or sentence by sentence. So let's go to the first sentence in this case here. From time to time, every one of us suffers. I'm just going to read that again. From time to time, every one of us suffers from the common flu. So what is missing here? And if you're at home and you're doing this with me, you know that you should have a full stop here. Reason being, or your clue in this case, the capital T. So you know that if there is a capital letter here, then something is missing to the end of this. And we know this is just simply given information. So at the end of this, we should have a full stop. The bravest, strongest, and those with the greatest willpower fight off this unwanted attacker. So what is missing here? The bravest, comma, strongest, and those with the greatest willpower fight off this unwanted attacker. Some of the symptoms of the common cold are we have a call on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Okay, I think we lost that call there. So I'm just going to give that call another opportunity. You know, call us back. We want to hear what you have to say. As well as all of you at home, uh, give us a call and share your ideas and your answers with us. Remember, if you are not 100% confident with punctuation and capital, le capital letters or capitalization, this is your chance for you to sit and to recap or reinforce all that you need to, right? And if it's the first time you are learning some of these, we are, of course, no, no problem with that. SE is April the 2nd, so that means that you ha still have some time to do some work. We have a caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hi, welcome to see results. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Vishala Budu. Hi, Vishala. So... We are on this sentence here now from some. Hi. So can you identify for me the missing punctuation? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The missing punctuation is a colon by a. Okay, excellent job. And uh, you want to continue with this rest of the sentence here? Yes. Okay. Are you there, Kola? Yes. Okay, go ahead. So we have a colon after R. Then we have sneezing, coughing, the runny nose, and at times severe headaches. Anything else there is missing? Any more missing punctuation? No. Sure. Look at it closely. A come after season. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your call. So right, guys. So at first glance, you know, she said no, but that's why it's important that you read and reread before you actually submit your paper. I urge you, do not just hand up your paper, you know, with all the excitement, or even if you're just frustrated for some reason. Relax, take a breath, you know, count one to 10, whatever works for you, and revisit that question if it's given you problems. You know, try your best to answer each and every question. You do not want to lose marks anyway, especially, you know, if it's something as simple as this, and, you know, it's just a comma there, but you're not seeing it at first glance, take your time, and I assure you, you will get it, okay? So be confident in yourself. Right, so we are here now. It is believed that the common flu is caused by a bacteria. We have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller, and welcome to see results. Hi. Hi, what's your name? Kairike. Hi, Kairike. So we are looking at from it, from here, it is... Yeah. Okay, so what, what is a missing punctuation or capital letter in this upcoming sentence? Um, capital I by it. Excellent job. Do you want to continue with the rest of the sentence then see if anything else is missing? 
Oh, is that it? Uh, it is. It is the way that I come out. Or even with the last sentence there, if you want to punct uh, punctuate that last sentence for me. Uh, mm, um, I think uh -huh. it's an, a full stop after cure. Yes. But, okay. anything, but anything before that, we'll say there is no cure. After a comma, after yes. Excellent job. Thank you so much, Thank Karen. Okay. Really did well there. So we're going to hold up on the calls just for a moment. We have another one of these um, paragraphs right after this one. So that caller who is just calling, just give us one minute as I just want to go, go back through this piece here. So in this last sentence, it is believed that the common flu is caused by a bacteria. We just uh, needed to put a capital I here to start this word. There's a first up, so we know a new sentence is next. And we do so with a capital letter. Worse yet, comma, there is no cure. Excellent job there, guys. So let's move on to the next paragraph. Again, it's the same, same thing we are doing where you have to punctuate each sentence. So Samantha has a pet dog called Fluffy which she feeds twice daily. She says, I feed Fluffy because I love him more than anything in the whole world. Samantha can often be heard speaking to Fluffy. Hey, pal, are you ready for your chicken wings? You know you love to crush the bones, don't you? So I'm going to give you a few seconds, read it over. And when you, when you are calling, you know, read that sentence and give us all the missing punctuations for that sentence. Oh, in that sentence. So you're looking at the first one there. Samantha has a pet dog called Fluffy, which she feeds twice daily. So I'm going to start it here. And you should know that Fluffy is a proper noun. Hence, it begins with a capital letter. We know it's a proper noun because it's the name of her dog. Samantha has a pet dog called Fluffy. Fluffy is a name, so we use a capital letter, which she feeds twice daily. She says, I feed. So you would notice here that she begins with a capital S, which begins as, or is the start of a new sentence. And if that's so, that means I need to have a full stop uh, at the end of the previous sentence. So moving on here, she says, I feed Fluffy because I love him more than... Do you see anything wrong with that line? And if you do, great job to you. And if you don't, pay attention. I here should be capital. And you should know that there are various um, uses for the capital I or that pronoun I. So you know that at the beginning of sentences for pronouns, um, not pronouns, sorry, proper nouns. And for even if it's in the middle of the sentence and so on. We already visited all the uses of the capital letter I, or that pronoun there, I. Let's move on. She says, I feed Fluffy because I love him more than anything in the whole world. Now, you will notice here, if you did not spot it before, at the end of this sentence, there's a full stop and close quotation, which means that is the end of a speech or dialogue. So that means I have to go back and find the beginning of that, that dialogue. And I will go back here where she says, she says. It gives me an indication that is the start of a dialogue. So it's she says, comma, open quotation, I feed Fluffy because I love him more than anything in the whole world. Samantha can often be heard speaking to Fluffy. Hey, pal, are you ready for your chicken wings? You know you... You know you love to crush the bones, don't you? So, and again, at the end here, you will see a question mark and close quotation. So, where does the open quotation uh, start? So, you have to go back now to the beginning of the sentence and find that start of the dialogue. And you can go back here. Samantha can often be heard speaking to Fluffy. So, here is your clue. Heard speaking to Fluffy. And this is what she's saying to Fluffy. It already has the comma there for you. So what is missing is your open quotation marks. 
Hey, pal, are you ready for your chicken wings? Come on. Now, we are not going to put close quotation marks here because it's not the end of her speech. And it's not a new speaker either. But however, we need a capital Y here as it's the end of a sentence right before. You know you love to crush bones, don't you? You have your contraction there, don't, right? So don't you. So you need your apostrophe there. Okay, guys? And I hope all of you got out all of these correct, right? And if you did, congratulations to you. And if you still have some work to do, I urge you to start working or continue with the good work. And I know a lot of you are putting in the effort and are really trying. We can tell from um, Edmodo where we put up all these quizzes and students you know, are so eager to submit or give us their submissions. And some of you are also really eager for us, you know, to put your names on the screen here, just as so just did with creative writing to showcase your work. And that, for me, you know, we really appreciate that. And that is also motivation for you students and motivation for us as well, okay? So we really appreciate that. And thank you guys for the continued support. So we, now we are finished with punctuation. We have um, now what is left to do in punctuation, which we will do again, just as we did a uh, week before, is just reinforcement exercises, where we usually have, um, you know, these example pieces, just as SEA has them in the booklet, so ELA booklet, and you have to get the answers and put them, put them in the paragraph or passage. So we will be doing some of that again soon, right? A little closer to SEA. We still have a lot of work in grammar to cover. We have comprehension to get started with, we have poetry and we have graphic to get working with as well, right? So we have a lot of work to do. So you don't want to miss any episodes because you know whatever you miss is going to be really important. And if you do, you still have the chance to go and rewatch these videos. So moving over to grammar now, we have here, uh, just as we were saying, we have here a sample paragraph. And in the sample paragraph, you have to read and identify the error, the grammatical error, that is. And in the box provided right to here, and to my right, you have to put the correct or correction of that word. So we are going to read it carefully, and then we are going to start working. When I turned the doorknob, it opened easy. I was immediately suspicious. The door should have been locked. I carefully pushed the door open. It was pitch black inside. I couldn't see nothing. I heard a low growl and then felt something brush past me. So as I usually do, I'm going to go through line by line and find that grammatical error and put my correction. When I turned the knob, it opened easy. So what do you think is your grammatical error here? If you underline the word easy, you are correct. Now we are going to describe how something is open, or how something opens, I should say, rather. Instead, we will use the adverb easily. So the, sen the line should now read, when I turned the door knob, it opened easily. Moving on to line two. I was immediately suspicious the door should. Would you say that you were immediately suspicious? What should it be? So if you underline suspicion, you are correct. But what should it really be? Suspicious. The correct form of the word here should be suspicious. Line three. And any time uh, we are reading a line and does not, is not the start of a sentence, I always encourage you to go back to the start of the previous sentence so that your ideas flow and you understand better what you are reading. I was immediately suspicious. Or we can read it with the correction. I was immediately suspicious. The door should have been locked. I carefully pushed the door. Now, this is a little tricky, and I'm wondering how many of you know the answer for this one. And if you have underlined off, you are correct, right? In fact, it should actually be have. And I'm going to explain to you shortly why it's have and not off. The door should have been locked. I carefully pushed the door open. It was pitch black open, sorry. It was pitch black inside. I couldn't. Now, what's your error in this sentence? Oh, it is a line. I carefully pushed the door open. It was pitch black inside. I couldn't. If you underline open, once again, you are correct. So what should open really be, 
right? The correct form of the verb open here should actually be open, right? Good so far. I hope all of you have earned at least eight marks up until this point. Next, I couldn't see nothing. I heard a low growl and then felt. What is the grammatical error here? I couldn't see nothing. Is that how we speak or is that how we should speak? What did I say rather? I couldn't see anything. Right? And your last line, I heard a low growl and then felt something brush past me. And your error or grammatical error here is past. And instead it should actually be past. I heard a low growl and then felt something brush past me. And once you have completed this um, task, read it over with the correction and ensure that your answers are correct and you are ready to move on to your next task or section two of the paper. So now we are going to critically analyze each one of these corrections. So the first line, your error here, when I turn the doorknob, it opened easy. We said that the error was easy, and in fact, it should be easily. Now, why should it be easily? Simply because easily there is an adverb. It describes how the door should be, how the doorknob turned, right? So the manner in which the doorknob turned, it was very easy to open. So we have been doing forms of words or forms of base words where you can change words from nouns to adjectives or ad for verbs to adverbs, not verbs, sorry, adjectives to adverbs and so on. So here's an example um, of a couple, or not an example, I should say rather, here's a task where we are going to change some of these adjectives into adverbs. So the lines are open once more, call us and help us change these forms of adjectives into adverbs. Just as we had easy, but the correction should be easily. If I have the word comic, what will the adverb form of comic be? Or usual? What about basic, noisy, or temporary? Right, so I'm going to do that first one for you there. And it should actually be comically. Right? Simple enough. What about usual? What should it be? Usually, if I have basic, I will say basically. If I have adjective noisy, have a call on the line. Good evening, call on. Welcome to see results. Noisy. Help. Sorry. Oh, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. N noisy. Help. What should your adverb be? Noisily. Yes, can you spell noisily for me? N O I S. Uh huh. Noisily. Sound it out. I S. No. Take a N Noisily. N O. N O I S. Yes. I L L Y. I. So you're almost correct. It's actually just one L there, right? L L. Just one L. So N O. Uh, sorry, N O I S I L Y. Noisily. Okay. Thank you so much for your call and that contribution. I'm being brave. So um, if you have some problems spelling any of these words so far, guys, add it to your spelling list and practice the spelling for these words. Okay. They may very well come in task one, which is your spelling section. You don't want to get that wrong. And what about um, your adjective temporary here? What should it, what should the adjective adverb form of this word? Temporarily, right? So we have comic, comically, usual, usually, basic, basically, Noisy, noisily, temporary, temporarily. What helps you also with your spelling is sounding out these words. 
Next. Here now, in, your, in line two, I was immediately suspicious. We know that error. There was suspicion. The door should. The door should. Right? So I was immediately suspicious. So similarly, uh, it's a noun form. Suspicion there is a noun. But we actually want your adjective form of the verb in this case. So we just did adjective to adverb. Now we're doing noun to adjective. So just how we had suspicion and we changed it to suspicious. Now we have disaster. The noun disaster. Fool, boy, legend, charity. Right? So now you have to call us and give us the adjective forms of these nouns. So if I have the word disaster, what will my adjective form of this word be? Right? And if you are thinking disastrous, you are correct. Okay? What about fool? Fool. Right? What, what can I use for my adjective there? And I can say foolish. His behavior is very foolish. So it's one thing that you know the adjective form or the adverb form or the noun form of these words. You must be able to use it correctly in your writing as well. Boy. Can you think of an adjective for the noun boy? What about boyish? Right? Boyish. What about legend? Right? I can say legendary right i can say legendary that movie was was legendary he was a legendary figure what about the noun charity right i have a call on the line good evening caller welcome to see results hi hi what's your name maya hi maya so Luckily, we have one noun remaining there, which is charity. Can you give us the adjective form of that word charity? Char charity. Yes. Sorry? Charity. Yes. No. Try again. Uh, use, use another uh, suffix. What can I end it with? I will have charit. He is a something person using, using that noun charity. He's a what kind of person? Uh, sorry, a uh, cheerful yeah. person. Sorry? Cheerful. It's not chair, the noun is not chair, but charity. So he's a... If I, if I, I give don't... you the suffix able, add that to the noun charity for me. Charitable. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your call and being brave, okay? And do you know how to spell charitable? Call, are you there? Okay, I think I lost that call there, but excellent job there, right? So you need to know, you need to know just one moment there. Charitable, right? So good job figuring out your answer here. So it sometimes comes, you know, that you need to know some suffixes to help you out to find your answer here. So great job. I really appreciate the confidence there. What about line three? Let's see. You know, we knew that the error here was off and should have actually been have. Now, why have? And you should know that you should know actually your auxiliary verbs. And have is one of your auxiliary verbs. So we don't say, or we should not say rather, should off, right? It should actually be should have been, right? And we're going to come across a few more auxiliary verbs and modal verbs where you should use should have instead of should off and so on. So the auxiliary have, meaning the auxiliary verb here, have must be used after could, would, should, must, and might. So once you come across the words or auxiliary verbs, could, would, should, must, or might, 
you must use have after these verbs here. Have must follow. So, for example, this is the incorrect version. We could have taken him to the beach instead. So it actually shouldn't have a full stop here. That's just an error. Your full stop should be here, right? So we could have taken him to the beach instead. This is actually incorrect. What it should actually be, or your correct, or what should actually, the grammatical correction for this should be, we could have taken him to the beach instead. Again, this is an error here. Your full stop should be to the end. What is important is could of should be replaced with could have. Grammatical error, your correction here. So just be mindful once you see the auxiliary verbs could, would, should, must, or might, you must use have after these verbs. So here I just have a couple sentences where I'm going to show you how to use um, that auxiliary and how have must follow. Right? So in case you don't know how to use it in a sentence, these are some examples where you learn how to use it in a sentence. They must have gotten our orders mixed up. Notice, must have. You have your auxiliary. Here you have your auxiliary have, must, and you have your helping verb there. Your modal, sorry. You have your auxiliary verb have, right? And must followed by the word must. So the, they must have gotten our orders mixed up. I could have made brownies if I, have, if I had remembered to buy eggs, right? So again, I could have. Have there follows the word could, or your auxiliary follows the word could. You should have answered the phone. Should have. Number four. He might have to leave for Canada at once. Once again might have right and number five she would have to she would have knocked him down so notice would have so it's must have must have could have should have might have would have okay not must off or could off or should off so just be mindful of that when you are writing or even simply when um when you have to identify it in a passage such as the what we just did it's easy for you to miss but once you read it carefully you are going to find it next error there uh, we said was open now let's discuss why it's open rather than opened i carefully pushed the door opened now pushed here carefully pushed the door right this is how the person pushed the door and they said they carefully pushed the door opened open here is past tense of the verb open however open o-p-e-n uh, is not a verb in this case it actually acts as an adjective it describes how the door was pushed once again open here acts as an adjective because it describes how the door was pushed o-p-e-n-e-d is a past tense of the verb open like to open something or to have opened something right so it acts as an adjective in this case rather than a verb now then number five or line five we had anything i couldn't see anything i heard a low growl and then felt now we said anything rather than nothing reason being uh it's called double negative right it's a double negative we have double negative because you couldn't so that's one thing here. You can't do something and then you're, or you're not able to do something and then you say see nothing. It's both negative. So here is your negative and here is also negative, right? You're not able to do something. That's what we mean by negative there, right? So a double negative exists in a sentence when two negative words, just as we saw, are used to convey one negative idea. So two negatives should never be used in one sentence. That's why we replaced, I couldn't see nothing with, I couldn't see anything. So for example, I don't have no money for the cake sale. This here, we have two negatives, don't and no. What should actually be, I don't have any money for the cake sale. Or, so both of these are actually correct here. 
uh, this one and this. So you can say I don't have any money for the cake sale or even correctly, I have no money for the cake sale. Both are correct in this case. Notice here we have double negatives in both of these sentences. Here we do not have double negatives. So here now, uh, this is your last chance to give us a call before time is up. We are drawing close to the end of the program. So uh, for just for today, if we don't have a ch uh, chance to complete it today, we are going to move on. Don't worry. We are going to get it done for our next ELA session, which is actually on Monday, right? Because on Thursday, as you know, we have creative writing again and mathematics. Good evening, Connor. Welcome to See Results. Yeah, we are going to move on. Don't worry. We are going to get it done. Oh, Hi, Kola. Good evening. Welcome to Series Us. Hi, good evening. Hi, what's your name? Vishala. Hi, Vishala. So, number one there, I want you to identify for me, um, what is your error in the sentence? The error is nothing. Sorry? The error is nothing. Right. No one will do nothing about crime. And what should I replace nothing with? Anything. Anything. Excellent job. Would you like to do number two for us as you are with us right now? Yes. Okay, go ahead. The error is no one. No one. And what should it be? Anyone. Anyone. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your call. We have another caller on the line. Good evening, caller. Welcome to see results. Hello. Hi, what's your name? My name is Soren. Nice to have you with us. So can you help us out with number three? Yes. Okay, please. go ahead. The word is nowhere. Nowhere. And what should it be? Anywhere. Anywhere. And would you like to do number four for us as you are here with us? Yes. Go ahead. The hospital yeah. won't or uh, uh, the word is no. Say that again? The word is no. Uh, is it just no or is it no more? Well, yes, actually, you are correct. It's actually uh, my mistake there, so it's no. What should I replace no with? Any. Any, excellent job. I was just saying that because it actually is any more. more. Excellent job. Thank you so much for your call and participation today. So, right, guys, so what we have, did, what we, what we have just done here, uh, we identified double negatives in, your, in the sentences, and I hope that you were able to do that at home. So, for example, no one will do nothing about crime. So, we have no one and we had nothing. So, we had to replace one of those and we replace nothing with anything. And similarly, we did that for sentence two, three, and four. Unfortunately, we are out of time. And uh, on next day, we are going to complete this task, this grammar task, and we are going to be moving on with some grammar again. It has been really great, um, you know, having you with us. And thank you for the calls and participation. And we look forward to seeing you on Thursday for Creative Writing and Mathematics. Don't forget to check out our Edmodo pages and our Facebook and YouTube channel as well. Like and subscribe, guys. And enjoy the rest of your afternoon, and I will see you in the new year. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, guys.